Reading from Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 34. Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Father, we thank you for this word, this part of your life now that we will consider this morning. Pray that you will hide the messenger. Pray that you will, by your spirit, clarify the meaning of this word. And that you will also apply it to our lives so that we leave different than we came. New, new view of you new view of our life in you. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, and if you have not already, please turn to Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 34. I think I've told you before about the young, kind of rowdy young boy who went to his first day of school, came home very excited, ran in the front door and said, Mom, Mom, they want me back. That's... Uh, kind of a great thing to feel if you're one of those rowdy young people that realizes you're not really welcome in a lot of different places. But how good to know that they want you back. Well, that's the message of our text today. God loves his rebellious creation and he wants us back. He wants us back. Tragically, many of us are not nearly as excited about that as that little boy was. Jesus makes his point here by drawing a very clear contrast between man's will and God's will. If you look with me again at verse 34, you can see this very clearly. He says, how often would I have, or literally the wording there reads, how often have I willed, willed, how often have I willed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you willed not. It's the same word that's used on both ends of that verse. So Jesus is saying, this is what I will, this is what you willed not. And he's contrasting very specifically the will of man versus the will of God. I will, you will not. The fact is that the history of mankind is basically the history of man pitting his will against God's will. The paradise in Eden was a paradise because specifically the will of God and the will of man were in perfect harmony. They were absolutely aligned. What was lost in the fall was alignment with the will of God. And man became, in his view, his own God. He exercised his own will and has been doing so ever since. And virtually every chaotic condition, every wicked result, everything that's wrong with the world is a result of mankind pitting our will against God's will. That's why in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us to pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what will bring everything back into per per perfection. We need to understand and to obey the will of God, not just for his glory, but for our good. The question is, whose will are we aligning with? That's the question. We're aligning with our own selfish ambitious, perverted will? Are we aligning with the perfect will of God? Now this message, beloved, is, is, is primarily for those who are not believers, but the fact is the same principles apply for those of us who are believers. Because even though we may have come to faith in Christ, it's perfectly, it's, it, it, it's our perfect tendency to still want and to still live on the basis of our own will while God is trying desperately to move us in his direction. And in this passage, 
to try and help move us in the direction of God's will, Jesus gives us a glimpse into the heart of God. He wants us to understand the God whom we serve. And so he shows us God's will, but then he shows us the result of Israel's I will not, so that we can see how drastic the contrast is with the hope of moving us in the direction of the will of God. So let's look at this, the, I, the, the wills of each and then the results of each of those. First of all, God's will. What is God's will? God's will, beloved, is really simple. God wills the redemption of his fallen creation. Redemption. That's God's will. When Jesus says, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, he's giving us a very vivid picture of the will of God, right? What does he will? He wills redemption. What does he will? He wills our protection under his mighty hand. Gathering chicks under the wings of the mother hen. It's a very clear picture. It's a very wonderful picture, is it not? If you have lived on a farm, if you have been around chickens, we had a few in the early days of, of, our, of, of my life. I think dad got rid of them eventually because of how messy they are. Uh, but uh, there were a few around in the beginning. I can remember very well watching as there would be some, the, the little chicks are running around the barnyard, right? Doing, you know, trying to feed themselves and doing whatever else little chicks do. But any sign of danger, some signal from the mother would signal them and they would all run and gather under her wings. And that's the picture Jesus is saying. This is my, this is my will for this rebellious nation of Israel. I, 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 I have come to gather you under my wings. This is my desperate desire for you. But you would not. So does he hate them for their rebellion? No, he does not hate them. It breaks his heart to see them reject, but he still opens the invitation. He still wants them to come. Despite their rebellion, this is his will for them. And he is, of course, in this case, reflecting not just his will, but the will of the heavenly Father. This is the will of God, beloved, that we come to faith in him and that we put ourselves under his control for our good and for his glory. No one will ever be able to stand before God one, one day and say, you didn't care. Won't happen. That will never happen. No one can possibly say that. God's heart has reached out to his fallen creation from the moment that sin first entered the human race. God at that moment pronounced a coming redeemer to Adam and Eve even as they stood there in their sin. God at that moment covered their feeble attempt to cover themselves with the sacrifice of his own and the person of those animals that were there reflecting the greater sacrifice that would one day come from the very beginning. God's heart has been open to his creation. Even John Calvin, the great theologian whose emphasis was on the election, the predestination of God, God's choice of those who would believe. And God's holiness said this. He said, your idea of God's nature is not clear unless you acknowledge him to be the origin and the fountain of all goodness. All goodness flows from God, beloved. God's love for his creation is infinite. The scripture is filled with it, beginning from beginning to end. While we were yet in our sins, trespasses and sins, Christ died for the ungodly. This is the message of the Bible. 2 Corinthians 30, Chronicles, sorry, 2 Chronicles 30, verse 9. Just listen to some of these passages. God says, for the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return to him. This is who God is. Matthew 9, verse 36 says, when he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That's how Jesus saw these rebellious people who were 
so intent on taking him down. Ezekiel 33, verse 11, God says, As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? There's the heart of God. Ezekiel 18, verse 32, for I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. The word turn in the Old Testament is basically the word repent. The word repent means to turn around. God's will is crystal clear, isn't it? Turn and live, repent and be renewed, be regenerated. This is what God desires. The problem isn't God. The problem isn't God. The problem has never been God. The problem is we who continually and sort of continuously turn our will against His. His reaction to our rejection, Jeremiah 13 Verse 17, he says, but if you will not listen, my, listen to this, listen to this. If you will not listen, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears. Listen, people who, who believe God is, you know, just sort of sitting up there issuing judgments and he's just doing this and that, no emotion. You forget, we are made in the image of God. Why do you have emotions? Why do you have strong feelings about certain things? It's because you are made like God. And what he's doing here in a passage like Jeremiah is giving us insight into the God that we serve. He's saying, if you will not turn, my soul will weep in secret. Wow. This is how God feels about those who reject, who reject him. God's will is clear. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, he says, This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing, literally not willing, same word as we have in Luke, not willing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God wills our repentance. He wills our repentance, first of all, so that we can come to him in faith and have the assurance of eternal life based on this, on this momentary decision that is a lifetime commitment. But he wills our ongoing repentance as well as believers to keep the fellowship intact with the Father who has become our Lord and Savior. Repentance, that's what God wills. Chuck Swindoll, the radio pastor, president of Dallas Seminary for a while, tells of something early in his life. He said he was performing with a Marine Corps band. I never have figured out which, which instrument he was playing. I'd like to find that out, but I don't, I don't know. Um, but he was playing with this Marine band, and they came to a leprosarium while, while he was serving in o Okinawa in 1958. Listen to how he describes what he saw there. He says, nothing prepared me for what I saw. I saw stumps instead of hands. I saw clumps instead of fingers. I saw half faces. I saw one ear instead of two. I saw the dregs of humanity, unable even to applaud our performance. I saw the faces of men, women, and even some teenagers in anguish, crying out. We could play music for them but we could not cleanse them of the disease. And then he makes this application. Listen to this. In Scripture, leprosy is a picture of sin. And we see that it is cleansed rather than healed. Only Jesus' blood has the power to cleanse us from our condition of sinful corruption. And he says, now I understand what Scripture says he was moved with compassion. He sees our souls, beloved, as those leprous, sinful things that they are. And God's heart is turned toward us. God has compassion. God loves 
those who are sinners and he wants to save them if they will only turn to him. God's middle name is compassion. You must not ever think of God in any terms other than those. No one will ever stand before God having rejected Jesus and say, you didn't care. The father will only have to turn toward his son and say, look at the nail prints in his hands. Yes, I cared. I loved you infinitely, but you didn't care for me. That's the problem. God wills all people everywhere to be saved. That's God's will. Secondly, what is Israel's will? What is Israel's will? Verse 34 of our passage. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hand gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. What a tragic ending to the gracious will of Jesus, is it not? I willed to gather you under my wings. I willed to forgive you. I willed to cleanse you. I willed to turn your life around. I willed to make you acceptable to the Father, not because of what you have done, but because what I will do for you. I willed, but you willed not. That sentence should read, I willed and you willed too, right? But it didn't in the case of Israel. Instead, it reads, you willed not incredibly. They rejected their own Messiah, fatal, a fatal rejection. John says it this way, John 1.11, Jesus came unto his own creation, the word there is neuter in the Greek, he came unto his own, his own creation, but his own now it's masculine, his own people, his own people, the Jewish people rejected him, did not receive him. Imagine, beloved, God came from heaven, took on the form, the nature of a man, so that he combined his divine nature with his human nature in a unique one being such as has never been on earth before, Amazing. He did that so that he could provide salvation for his people. And what did they do? They rejected him. They rejected him. They turned him down. How could that happen? Jesus knew. Jesus says in John 3, 19, I know. He said, this is the condemnation. This is the judgment that the light, meaning himself, has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. What is he saying? He's saying men loved their sin more than they loved Jesus. That's the reason people reject. They want their sin more than they want him. Paul says it another way in Ephesians 4.18. He says, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Why? Due to their hardness of heart. Rejectors are blind to spiritual truth, pre preferring their own way to God, somehow thinking that they know more than God, thinking they can figure it out thinking they have the right answers and God doesn't. How arrogant could we possibly be? God has taken the time to reveal himself in his word and we say, no, I know better. Blind. Rejectors are like the man who ordered a $100 correspondence course on mental telepathy. Thought he would be good to find out about this. And so he ordered this course. A month went by, nothing had come. And so he called them up to find out what was going on. He said, I ordered this course, nothing's happened. And they said, well, we don't send that course out by mail. We send that course out by mental telepathy. And the guy said, well, I, so I still have, it's been a month and I still haven't received anything. And the receptionist says, yeah, I know. So far you're flunking the course. <laughs> There you are. That's what rejectors are, beloved. They're, they're flunking the course. They're flunking the revelation of God, the things of God 
Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 2 are spiritually discerned and their spiritual receptors are turned off. They're living only in what they can see, hear, feel, touch, and see. Not on the revelation of a God who knows beyond what we can sense. And so they've turned him down. They've turned a blind eye to truth. They don't want to be accountable. And so they deny that there is such a thing as accountability, which would be great, except what if there is accountability? It would be like us going out and running a red light and killing somebody and saying, so what? There is no such thing as a human court, but of course there is. So our denial would do no good, would it? Neither does denying the truth of God, beloved. God allows us in our human with our, with our human will, with the choice, the ability to choose that he has given us, he allows us to choose against him. But there are consequences. There are consequences. And that's why Jesus goes on to talk about what those consequences are. So point number three, Israel's result. Israel's will is rejection. What is Israel's result from the, re from the rejection? The result is Ruin. The result is ruination. Rejection always results in ruin sooner or later. It doesn't matter. You know, as an unbeliever, the ruination will eventually be eternal. As a believer, the ruin will be the mess up that's in your life. If you're not obeying the commands of God and aligning your will with His. But ruin there will be. You, you can pit your will against God, beloved, but you can't pit your will against God and win. That's the fallacy. You can't. Verse 35, Jesus says, Behold, your house is forsaken. Your house is forsaken. House here symbolizes not just the temple, but it symbolizes Jerusalem and it symbolizes the nation as a whole. Jesus is saying, you've rejected me, now I must reject you. And the result will be your house, your nation, your city, your temple, your lives will be left to you desolate. And we will see they will be desolate, not just of Jesus, they will be desolate of themselves as well. The Jews knew exactly what Jesus was saying when he said, your house will be left desolate. This was not the first time they had heard those words. Several times in their past, God had sent judgment to them and on them because of their sin, because of their continuation in idolatry. Probably the greatest of those in their past, it wasn't going to match what was about to happen to them, but the greatest in their past had been the Babylonian captivity in 606 BC when Nebuchadnezzar swept through, took many of the cream of the crop of Israel captive in 606 and took them to, to, back to Babylon. Two more captivities happened in 597 BC and again in 585 as as he eventually finished off the job, as Israel continued to be in rebellion, removed many people from Israel to Babylon and during those days. God spoke about that time in Jeremiah chapter 12, and here's what he said. God said, I have forsaken my house. The people of Israel knew that verse was in the Bible. I have forsaken my house. I have abandoned my heritage. Now listen to this. I have given the beloved of my soul. Do you see the compassion of God? I've, uh, I've had to do this. I've forsaken my house. I've abandoned my heritage. I've given the beloved of my soul into the hands of her enemies. I mean, you can, you can hear the pathos of that statement, right? The compassion of God as he writes this, even as he executes judgment. Listen, beloved, if you're, if you're one of those ears convinced this morning that God's love precludes God's judgment, don't go away fooled. God's love does not preclude his judgment. God's love, in fact, demands his judgment. Otherwise, the world and all of creation would go on forever in this awful, wicked state. 
That captivity in Babylon in 600 BC cured Israel, by the way, of outward idolatry. That became something they didn't get involved in anymore. But in the meantime, they still became outward religionists. They never got the point that it's what is inside that counts. It's the heart that God is looking for. They never got that as a nation. It's about a relationship, not about a religion. They didn't get that. And so when Jesus came, they were still under the guidance of the Pharisees and the religious leaders of their time, still trying to work their way to heaven instead of turning their heart over to God. Their failure to realize that led to the rejection of their own Messiah. Now they were going to face the consequences. Jesus talks about these consequences later on. We'll go into it in more detail when we get there, but in Luke 21, if you're in 13, just... Turn over a couple of pages to Luke 21. And in verses 5 and 6, he says, And while some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, and we know it was the disciples who were saying this to him, to him as they were walking out of the temple one day, look at this beautiful building, Lord Verse 6, and he said, as for these things that you see, the days will come where there will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. That's a reference to the same judgment that he's talking about in Luke 13. And it all happened exactly as Jesus said it would. In 70 AD, about 40 years after this, Rome came because of the continuous rebellion on the part of the Palestinians. And Rome devastated the city of Jerusalem. They first laid siege, took them several months, about five months before they finally got in and sacked that city. You can go there today and see the stones that Jesus is talking about lying at the bottom of the wall where they were thrown down by the Romans. And you can see the huge cracks in the walkway there when the stones were thrown down. Exactly as Jesus said is exactly how it happened. Josephus, the Jewish historian of that time, gives us more detail about what happened. He actually says that there were a million Jewish people who were killed and another 100,000 who were sold into slavery. Those numbers are almost unquestionably greatly exaggerated because as, as best we know, there were somewhere between 80,000 and maybe 200,000 people living in Jerusalem at that time. But the point isn't that the numbers are exaggerated. The point is there was huge problems in Jerusalem. The devastation was very real. People were so famished that he says the roofs were thronged with famished women with babies in their arms. The alleys were filled with corpses. He says this, he says, quote, children and young people swollen from starvation roamed like phantoms through the marketplaces and collapsed wherever their doom overtook them. Israel finally had to surrender and they ceased to be as a nation. Their house was left to them desolate. The Jews became the most hated people in the world, I think it's fair to say. By AD 630, an emperor named Heraclitus banished them forever from the city of Jerusalem. So for hundreds of years, no Jew could set foot in that city leaving their house desolate. Anti-Semitism, as we all know, became fashionable worldwide, leading to the events of the Holocaust in the 20th century. In God's providence, he used that event to bring about the reestablishment of Israel as a nation, which is unprecedented in human history. And a nation that's been gone for 2,000 years is suddenly there again. It's an unprecedented prophetic event that's happened in the lifetime of most of us. I think I got it by, I think I was born nine days before that happened, so I got in on it. Some of you may be a little too late, but that event happened in my lifetime. God brought this nation back into existence. But beloved, the worst is yet to come. While Israel is being regathered and has been regathered in fulfillment of God's ancient promises to Abraham and through the prophets, 
You can read about it in many of the prophets in the Old Testament. They remain today as a nation in rebellion against their Messiah. Individual Jewish people, yes, are believers, but the nation as a whole is not. And so Revelation chapters 6 through 19 detail the events of a great period of tribulation that will come yet upon Israel with the result of bringing them finally to turn in faith to the Messiah that they have rejected. But what suffering it will take to get to that point. Listen, beloved, God's love does not preclude God's judgment. They're just two sides of the same coin. His compassion is staggering. If you can't see that from the verses I've read this morning, I don't know how else to convince you, but God's compassion is so staggering that he sent his own son to die to pay the penalty for our sin. But if we will not turn and repent to him as he constantly mentions when he talks about his compassion, our house too will be left desolate. People outside of Christ, they're, <laughs> they're kind of like this. They're like, they're like these two guys who are struggling to get a car open, right? They've, left the, they've locked the keys in the car. They're, they're, too, they're, they're two bricks short of a load. And they've left the keys in the car. They're trying with their hanger to get the door open, right? Just struggling to get this door open. Can't get it. One of them says, I can't seem to get this door unlocked. And the other says, well, listen, you better hurry up. Keep, I mean, try harder. Because look, it's starting to rain and the top is down. It's going to get all wet. But beloved, as, as silly as that sounds, that's like people outside of Christ saying, I, I, how am I going to get right with God? How am I going to win God's approval? I know what I'll do. I'll try harder. I'll do better. I'll give more. I'll get more involved. I'll do something. And the whole time, the top is down. The way to God is wide open. But it's a narrow way of repentance. It only goes through Christ, but it's wide open. Trying harder will not get us there. The solution was bought and paid for by the death of Christ. But Israel would not accept it. It is their will against God's. That's always a losing proposition. So let's look at the final point. What is Israel's Israel's will is rejection and Israel's result is ruination. God's will is redemption and God's result is what? Restoration. Regeneration. Renewal. Choose your word. God's result is wonderful. There's, do you see there's a formula here? You see the formula? Man's will equals ruin. Always. Always. Every time we pit our will against God, every time we go against God's commandments, every time we say, I know better than God, it always leads to ruin, eternal ruin if we will never come to faith in Christ. And even as a believer, the mess up of our life because we're not living according to God's will. We're aligned with our own instead of God's. I, I bet I could go around the room today and every one of us could testify to the truth of that statement in some way, shape, or form. We've all been there, and yet we have that continual thought that somehow we know better, that God's commands are outdated. They're not. They still reflect his character, and it's the only way to be right with God. So the formula, man's will yields ruination, God's will yields restoration. Verse 35, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Who is he who comes in the name of the Lord? Jesus. Until you're willing to say, blessed Jesus. I understand who Jesus is. I give my heart and life and soul to Jesus. That's how you bless him. Until you say that, you're on the outside looking in. The hope for this generation of Israel is not going to come because this generation has rejected Jesus. Rather than bless him, they have rejected him. Rather than look to him as their Lord, they have rejected him 
as their Lord and they have crucified him. Not only will they suffer the physical desolation we've already looked at, that will represent the greater spiritual devastation that awaits all of those who are outside of Jesus Christ. But God was not and is not done with Israel as a nation, right? He's not. He made promises to Abraham 4,000 years ago. You can read about him in Genesis 12 and 17 and 22, and you can read in Genesis 15 and see how the promises were unconditional. Meaning God said, I'm gonna do this whether you get it right or not. I'm gonna do this whether your people get it right or not. I will discipline them along the way, but I'm gonna accomplish my purposes through you. God is not finished with Israel. In the end, he will bring Israel as a nation to bow before his lordship just as he does every single person whom he chose before the foundation of the world to be a child of God. And so he says, I tell you, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, there's a couple of implications of that statement, right? One of them is you can't come if you don't first go away. He's going to leave. And his leaving is going to mean that this generation is not going to benefit from the statement that he's just made. This generation has lost their chance. This is the most privileged generation of all time because they saw Jesus Christ face to face. They walked with him. They talked with him. They interacted with him. They had the greatest revelation of God that anyone could possibly have. But that generation who had that great revelation is at the end of their rope. Their privilege is ended when they killed him. That generation brought destruction on themselves. And even, this is one of the reasons, people sometimes puzzle over this, but did you notice that even in his resurrected body, Jesus didn't go out appearing to unbelievers. Do you ever notice that? He appeared to the believers. He appeared to those who had trusted in him. He appeared to those who were faithful to him, but he didn't go back and try and make the case to the unbelievers. They had rejected him and that was it. Their privileged opportunity was over. He rejects those who reject him. And he rejected Israel because they rejected him. But that is not the end of the story. There awaits a generation of Israel yet to come that will eventually pronounce blessing upon him as a nation. And they will look to the one that they have crucified and they will finally bless him. Why? Because they're so good or because they deserve it? No simply because God made promises and God keeps promises. God keeps promises. So when will all this happen? When will Israel say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord? And you know the answer to that at the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's when this will happen. A couple of descriptions. Let's look at Matthew 24. Turn back couple of books to Matthew 24. <clears throat> There's a whole, Matthew 24 and 25 is a, is a very lengthy description of future events that Jesus gives toward the end of his ministry here on earth. And let's just start at verse 29. Matthew 24, verse 29. Jesus says, immediately after the tribulation of those days. That's a reference to Daniel's 70th week from Daniel 9. Any of you have studied that? It's a reference to what's going to happen in Revelation chapters 6 through 19 that we've all already referenced. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. It's going to be a pretty dramatic time, is it not? When the all this stuff starts to happen. It says then in verse 30, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. That's a reference to Jesus, of course. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from, the, from one end of the heaven to the other. That's the time. 
when Israel will, as, as a nation will turn to God. You say, well, I don't see anything about Israel as a nation. I just see a lot of tribes and all that stuff there. Well, turn back with me to Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah is the next to the last book at the end of the Old Testament, so you can find it, right? Those prophets are hard to find. Next to the last, Malachi and then Zechariah going backwards. Zechariah 12. Zechariah chapter 12, and look at this beginning in verse 10. Zechariah 12, verse 10. Here is the prophet's view written 400 years before the time of Christ. Here's the prophet's view of what Jesus has just prophesied in Luke 13. Zechariah 12, verse 10. God says, And I will pour out on the house of David, that's Israel, of course, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look, what did Jesus say? You'll not see me, you'll, you'll, you'll see me again, you'll not see me again until... What? You say, blessed is he. Here's the generation that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced. Crucifixion. Zechariah saw it. When they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn, the nation will turn at long last. Can you imagine the Israelites, the Jewish people of today, turning and acknowledging Jesus Christ as Savior? That's what's going to happen at his second coming. And that's the generation that will say, blessed is the one. Instead of saying, as the generation of Christ said, take him and crucify him. What a difference. Jesus picks up, John picks up the same theme in Revelation 1, verse, beginning in verse 5, John says this to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who who pierced him, the Jewish people. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so. Amen. <coughs> this is the result of following the will of God. It's to be part of the greatest coming out party in history. What's Jesus come to earth to do? came to earth to seek and to save those who are lost, right? That's our key verse in Luke, Luke's gospel, Luke 19, 10. He's come specifically to defeat the powers of evil, 1 John 3, verse 8. He has come to undo all the effects of the fall from Genesis 3. That's why he has come. He's come to realign man's will with his will. That's why he's come. And if you remember, prior to the fall, what was the great duty that God gave to mankind, that he gave to Adam and Eve? Way back in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 1, verse 28, he told them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. What is the result of following God's will instead of my will? It is to rule and reign and have dominion dominion with him forever because that's what God promises to those who love him you will rule and you will reign with me forever restored to the dominion that we were intended to have in the first place that can be your future it doesn't have to be ruination it can be regeneration and renewal and restoration that's what God wants. That's what God wills. But you must trust Christ to provide the possibility of your redemption and mine cost Jesus everything. To accept the invitation will, will, will cost you your life. That's why Jesus said, if anyone will come after me, 
Let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross daily and let him follow me. You must exchange your life for his. You must exchange your will for his will. But I hope you can see it's way worth it. Way worth it. Why would you want your end to be anything different than this? It's a decision you will never regret. It's a move from the losing side to the winning side. Your will will always equal ruin. His will, redemption, restoration. Ronald Pinkerton was a skilled hang glider in the days when that was still very much in vogue. He's at about 4,200 feet hang gliding one day when all of a sudden, despite the fact of his expertise, he, he lost control. A big wind came through, sent his glider plummeting toward the ground. It's kind of like a, an airborne riptide. Nothing he could do was helping. So as he's <laughs> barreling toward the ground, he happens to glance out and he sees a red-tailed hawk out there. And he notices that the red-tailed hawk is having the same problem. He was fighting the same downdraft. But then he noticed the red-tailed hawk just kind of banked uh, his wings, and then he just, he just went into a dive toward the earth, letting the wind take him where it would. And the thought that crossed Ron Pinkerton's mind was, follow the hawk. Now, <laughs> there was nothing about that that made sense. There was nothing about that that was easy. There was nothing about that that, that would have um, corresponded to anything he had ever learned about how you handle a hang glider. Follow the hawk on a death spiral? But that's what he did. There was nothing else left to do in one sense. Nothing he was doing was working. And so he followed the hawk. And he went down. He let himself at the mercy of the wind. They got to 400 feet. They got to 300 feet. They got to 200 feet, still barreling toward the ground. And then suddenly at 100 feet, some source that he never understood, and I don't know how the hawk knew about this, but all of a sudden a warm, a warm updraft they hit a warm up draft, and all of a sudden the hawk was floating back up. And the next thing Ron Pinkerton knew, his, his hang glider had also turned, and he was floating on this warm up draft until he could get control again. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a perfect picture of turning your will over to God's will. Your will will take you to destruction, it will take you to Eternal destruction if you are outside of Christ. It will take you to a ruined life if you, are, if you are in Christ. But if you will follow the will of God, whether it makes sense to you or not, that you can have all the privileges and rights that come with being a child of God. God's will versus ours. Let's choose his. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God, for the revelation you've given to help us understand, um, the, the, to understand the contrast between you and us, to help us understand the issues, to help us understand the consequences of both. So, light anew in our hearts. Father, I'm assuming most of the people here today are Christians. They've trusted you as Savior and Lord. I, I realize full well that some have not. Some think they have and haven't, and there may be even some here who know they haven't. And Lord, I, my prayer is the same as your prayer, that you would grip their hearts and that you would bring them to yourself this morning, cause them to once and for all turn their will over to you, turn their life over to you. Lord, for those of us who know you, but we are living some way outside of your will. We are, we are disobedient to commands that we don't like. We're happy to conform to the ones we like, but the ones that seem outdated, the ones that seem archaic, the ones that hit at our particular desires, we are avoiding and we are in rebellion. And it can only lead to unhappiness, not just for us, but for others. So Father, would you please this morning
turn our hearts toward you. Cause them to be tender as yours is. Help us to claim the promises that if we will turn, you are there. Thank you for that. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.